are live. Awesome. Olá, cervejeiros, sommeliers, entusiastas de cerveja. Será que vai funcionar essa coisa tão audaciosa quanto fazer uma live é, com tradução simultânea? Vocês vão ter aqui embaixo, então, a tradução. Enquanto eu falar português, não vai fazer o menor sentido, porque ele está tentando traduzir do português para o inglês para o português e não, não dá muito certo. Mas, se não funcionar hoje, amanhã vai estar legendado certinho aqui e a gente tem hoje um convidado muito especial. Passarei a tentar falar inglês a partir de agora. Meu inglês não vai ter uma tradução muito boa, porque eu sou carregado de... É... Accent? Eu esqueci até a palavra em português. Olha que porcaria. Coisa metida, né? Então, digam aí se o áudio está pegando, se está tudo certo. I'm just in checking if is everything going uh, good with the stream. And today, tonight, we have here Scott Janish, author of the book The New IPA uh, and partner in this brewery, uh, which he is right now, with his Sapwood Cellars, right? Thank That's you right. for joining us tonight, Scott. Yeah, of course, absolutely. It's nice to see you again. Okay, let's see if this is working. Uh, you can see the live stream, you know, uh, for the link I sent you. Looks like it's working to me. Okay. Uh, is, is everything working for you guys? Is the translation working good? I think it is. <laughs> Okay, uh, most people know you for your IPAs, but uh, you have this IPA book, but also you have uh, a partnership in this brewery and you guys do a lot of barrel-aged beers, right? Yeah, that's right. So my partner is Michael Tomsmeyer, who of course wrote uh, American Sour Beers uh, like five or six years ago now. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, been my handbook um, when it comes to um, brewing sour beers and, and working with with barrels both now at the brewery and I also had a um, 15 gallon brewer or a barrel at home too that I, I still actually homebrew into um, so yeah I've learned I've learned a lot with uh, about sour beers um, through him and we've it's been kind of nice that we both kind of had our own separate um, areas that we got a little obsessed with and researched and wrote about and then we can sort of you know, you know play those off of each other now uh, this is the book uh, Scott uh, is talking now American sour beers which is a really good book we used some uh, parts of this book in, in the talk yesterday do you guys remember uh, like we using the the process flow like this one for uh, Asian sour beers And how how are things going there, uh, Scott? Uh, good. It, of course, it's a it's a strange, weird time. I think probably for everyone right now. Um, but we are um, still open, still able to to sell beer. Um, we're still brewing new beer. In fact, we're we're expanding. We're still waiting um, for new tanks to arrive. Um, they're stuck stuck in port somewhere right now. Um, but we're having to do all to go or uh, can orders. So we're, we have mobile canning company that comes in once a month, um, kind of empties out our, our tanks. Um, and then we also hand can uh, in the meantime, just from, from kegs. And then we just do online sales and then a couple hour pickup window. So it's been, um, it's been working pretty good for us. In fact, we're right now pretty low on beer. So Yeah, um, that, that's not easy, right? Uh, it's, yeah. it's been really hard for everyone. Uh, here in Brazil, uh, mo uh, there, there are a lot of breweries going bankrupt. Um, yeah, it's too bad. I mean, hopefully, you know, hopefully there's enough, you know, help from, from all the various, uh, you know, governments um, in each country. And, and hopefully they, they care a little bit about breweries. Um, Lucky, luckily, in the U.S., or at least in, in the state of Maryland where I'm at right now, it's um, beer is still considered essential, and those are the only businesses that are allowed to be open um, are the essential ones. So, 
Scott, your translation is not working anymore. Uh, can you check out your? Yeah, apps? sure. Uh, I still have it up. Okay, now now it's working. Okay, I might. I just can't let it uh, the the screen saver thing come on. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about wood. Uh, yeah. What do you guys do in your brewery? Uh, do you have a lot of sour uh, wood aged beers, right? Yeah, so we pretty much, you know, 90, what, 95, 98% of our, our barrels are um, sour, um, sour mixed fermentation um, barrels. We, we, we did have about four or about eight clean barrels. Um, and when I say clean, that just means there's Saccharomyces in the, in the barrel. There's no, there's no bread, there's no PDO, there's no lacto. Um, and we will, sometimes we'll get fresh bourbon barrels or something and run an Imperial stout through it. Um, but we just, after we emptied those once we just turned them into, to sour beers, uh, just a, like a couple weeks ago. So we have about 60, um, the 60. Translation is not beers. going really good. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's <not>. funny. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, there's only, there's only so much you can do. Uh, Ricardo just asked if you can uh, speak slowly because people can understand better. Sure. Yeah, I'll do. I'll do my best. Okay. Uh, and my audio is too low. Okay. I think it's good now. Uh, Scott, most people uh, who watch Beer School uh, are home brewer. And here in Brazil, mm -hmm. we have a lot of woods, like uh, hundreds of woods to try. And I think this can be the, the way we have to show the world our beers. Because uh, not, not just here in Brazil, but all Latin America and Africa uh, have this exotic woods for use. And then we have some pretty good stuff like Emburana, you know? Have you ever tried? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, last time I, I was in Brazil, in fact, when we were both speaking at the, the same conference, I uh, brought back quite a bit of, of Brazilian wood. Um, and we've used a of them in, in, the, in the brewery. Oh, do you um, have an Ambruana? Ambruana. Yeah, so we got some uh, spirals that I, I brought back and we've used in a, in a couple different beers. Um, I absolutely love how cinnamon forward that that wood is and to me it almost smells like a cinnamon roll Scott, um, and so we had people are asking me to turn turn off the subtitles and subtitle tomorrow because it's uh, it's not good <laughs> okay, okay bye bye <laughs> <laughs> i guess i guess it's just more work more work for you but okay you guys try it, i guess então, pessoal, agora, a partir de agora, não vamos ter mais legenda. A gente coloca a legenda amanhã. Fazer o quê, né? Então, é, eu peço que vocês se man mantenham aqui na live, tentem entender. Vou pedir para o Scott falar é, um pouco mais baixo. Um pouco mais baixo, não. Um pouco mais devagar. E amanhã vai estar tá tudo certinho. Então, a gente vai, basicamente, começar a live de novo para eu cortar a partir de agora e ficar tudo certinho. <risos> <laughs> what are you laughing, man? I, I, so the translation, so it, it, apparently this is telling me you said something about a, a cola collision and a Pokemon bash. bash. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we I have can the bugs, right? Yeah, I can see why it wasn't working very good. <laughs> okay. What are you drinking now? Uh, I actually have uh, uh, Spencer, who uh, is our uh, taste her manager here. Um, And also a really good brewer himself just gave me uh, a, a two-year-old, I believe, um, Chardonnay Goza that he made. Um, oh, man, so that's, that, sound, that sounds incredible. Yeah, I'm a big fan of combining wine grapes um, into beer, especially sour beer. Um, getting, getting Brett involved with um, wine grapes can be a, a fun thing. It's, it's um, similar in a lot of ways to, to natural wines. Um, so they can be, they can be a lot of fun to have. Okay. Let's go to the process. Uh, uh, by the way, I'm drinking uh, the two lagers, uh, both with Emburana and Oak. Uh, it's really, really simple lager, 
just to it it will it it will sound really bad in Portuguese to feel the wood. Does it seem weird for you? To... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little bit, but, oh, I, okay. but I know what you mean. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so you just have uh, some some wood chips right in your glass? Yeah, I have the this uh, alcoholic solution uh, of oaks and kumaru. Have you ever heard about kumaru? No. Uh, it's a uh, a tree here in Brazil that has the seeds that taste so much like uh, vanilla and it's amazing. And this is a hydraulic solution of Emburana. I toasted myself this afternoon. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, they, like like I was saying a little earlier, we were we actually just uh, last week had a beer come out with Emburana. Um, and we uh, did a uh, coffee um, coffee porter. And so we got coffee. Um, I always think it's best to add coffee to beer the same day it's roasted. Um, oh, that sounds great. Yeah, because when, when coffee is roasted, it, it off gases CO2. And, you know, that's why you'll see a lot of those, you know, coffee bags have that little breather on them so that, you know, oxygen is not getting in. But the CO2 that's off gassing from the beans is able to escape. Um, so the idea is you can um, get the, the coffee beans in the beer while it's still off-gassing CO2, and that way it, it doesn't really get oxidized. Um, a lot of coffee beers can come across pretty green pepper-like, um, and I think that's just a, a, a factor of, of oxygen on um, getting into beans um, too late in the process. So we had coffee beans from a, a local roaster that roast uh, for us, um, and then we throw them into the beer about about eight hours or, or less after it's roasted. And then we then aged it for about a week and a half on some wood chips, on run wood chips. And it's just like this cinnamon raisin coffee porter kind of thing. And it's, it's, it's outstanding. I love that wood. I, I wish I could have this beer. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about process. Uh, sure. How do you use uh, this uh, wood uh, barrels in your brewery? Is there any special technique? Uh, is there a way uh, you often do? Uh, or is always uh, a, a new thing and uh, adventure discovering uh, new stuff? Um, you know, for the most part, we, we have mostly wine barrels. Um, and so we'll get uh, some local wineries um, will, will give us some barrels um, or we'll get a lot of them from the West Coast, mostly California. Um, and when we, we get a new barrel in, um, we'll generally, you know, give it a give it the good sniff test, you know, smell it, make sure it doesn't smell um, off. It should just smell like fresh, fresh wine. So if a barrel has been sitting empty for too long, you can start to have some problems. Um, and, and depending on the beer, we'll sometimes let it soak overnight with uh, some, some hot water, some hot filtered water. Um, that would be if we're going to do like a lambic base, a lambic inspired beer, so like a pale sour beer. Um, if you soak it overnight, we're hoping we, we one, it, it tests the barrel to make sure that it's, it's not leaking and maybe it'll kind of swell um, and then stop the leak. So it's, it's water leaking and not, and not beer. And also kind of just... Um, the, the warm water can take a little bit away of that, that barrel profile because um, a, pale, a pale sour beer um, sitting in a, you know, a freshly dumped wine barrel might pick up a little too much of that, that wood character. Um, and so that can help kind of help that a little bit. So we'll do that with our, with our um, pale lambic beers. Um, but generally we're, we're fermenting these beers uh, in stainless. Um, so we'll give them you know, a week or, or two weeks in stainless. Um, the primary fermentation, we're not overly concerned about uh, what what yeast that we use for it. Um, so much of those beers, the character is coming from the bacteria and the time in the barrel. Um, so we'll just do two weeks with with whatever kind of yeast is that we have handy. Um, sometimes even wine yeast, and then we'll go, we'll uh, transfer into barrels. Um, I guess first we'll purge those barrels with CO2. Um, we'll give them a good like 15 minute purge through a uh, a carb stone, so it, it really um, spreads that CO2 out good. Um, 
we usually will, I mean, if you stick your nose in, in the bunghole, it should like, you should smell that CO2. It should almost kind of like knock you back a little bit. And then you know that yeah, it's, it's th that's pretty. not good, right? You have <laughs> no, the, but... this uh, carbonic acid f uh, forming in your nose. It's really bad. Uh, yeah. It's the same when you are a home brewer, you have this uh, horizontal freezer. A refrigerator and keep it closed and oh, make... no, when you open. <laughs> yeah when you open that's uh that's not good so uh the first thing you, uh, you do when you have the these barrels which most of them are used in uh in wine right is mm -hmm. to smell yeah it's the first thing you do yeah and i mean it's it it's the same the first thing i do with, with a lot of things in brewing you know the, even when i'm using hops for example um if i'm going to dry hop a beer i open the bag i smell the bag first um you know things don't just if, if they smell from the start they're not gonna they're not gonna magically get any better okay um, and uh when it comes in a, a, a barrel uh, a wine barrel it must it smells like wine good wine yep is it uh is it, is this possible to be as acidic? As um, acidic acid? Yeah, acidic. Like acidic. Uh, like a smell. Yeah, I mean, really, what you're you're trying you don't want to smell things like you know like nail polish remover. You don't want to smell a lot of sulfur. You don't. I mean, it, it, you should just smell like um, you know, like a lot of that wood sort of maybe like a little vanilla wood character or um really just whatever ha was held the last residence you know if it was a bourbon barrel it should smell like it should smell like the bourbon still if it was a chardonnay barrel it should still have sort of that chardonnay you know uh, minerality kind of smell but um so yeah we, we always give them the good sniff test and, and usually if you find a good for us we usually buy them from um barrel brokers so people that just uh, specialize in, in selling barrels and so we're usually getting them pretty fresh um oh, nice. we, we just did a, uh, or we're doing a collaboration with a local natural winery in Maryland called Old Westminster. Um, and the day they dumped, the day they emptied their barrels, um, we went and picked them up and filled them that same day. So we tried to do, oh, um, get something in quick. as quick as possible. Yep. Yeah. And being in, uh, around this, these wineries uh, helps you, right? Yeah, in fact, especially if we're, um, you know, I'm on the, the East Coast where there's definitely some great wineries, but there's just the far more um, wineries on the on the West Coast. So that's why a, a good chunk of our barrels are coming from, um, are, are being shipped to us. But if we can get, um, a, you know, coordinate a, a pickup from a local winery, like we, we prefer that. How much does a, a barrel cost in the uh, U.S.? I, I think it's you uh, usually probably a couple hundred bucks or so. Yeah. Um, it it kind of depends on on where you're buying it, but and that's uh, probably a better question for Michael. He's the one. He's the one. <laughs> he's the one buying. <laughs> okay. And um, how about the fresh barrels? Do you use fresh barrels? And how how you inspect them? What do you do with fresh barrels? Um, we've never used like a brand, brand new barrel. It's, it's always been used oh, nice. um, yeah, by, by someone else. And that's kind of, it's kind of the fun because you can, you can try to build your recipe and build the plan for a beer uh, around the barrel because the barrel is going to obviously impart some of the flavor. Um, so you want to do your best to try to plan for that and have it kind of fit the profile of the beer. Um, sour beers, you can try your best for that, but you're, you're not always 100% sure uh, which direction they're going to go. Um, but usually it's, you know, if we'll do, let's say we do a base beer, let's like a, a Flanders red um, or an Imperial Flanders red. So we'll brew that and stain this. Um, we'll get five wood barrels, probably three wine barrels and maybe one or two bourbon barrels. Um, and so that way, all of our beer, we, we blend together afterwards. Um, so, you know, if we put if we brew a batch that goes into five barrels, we don't, those five barrels aren't individual beers and they're also not just one big beer. Um, we'll taste them after about a year and put together, um, you know, what, what we think is the best blend. You know, maybe one beer is really funky, one beer uh, is really acidic and one beer is kind of neutral and the three together kind of make, make the best pairing. But if you have uh, mostly wine barrels, but you also threw some of it into a, 
uh, bourbon barrel, then you can kind of sneak in a little like vanilla oaky character um, that can go really well with, you know, something like cherries or something down the road. So um, it, it's nice to kind of create as many options as possible when it comes to, to blending the beer. And when you are using this uh, wild fermentations and wood, uh, you have to have in mind that blending is uh, always uh, an option you might uh, use, right? And blending is something really uh, subjective, right? Uh, it's uh, about you, uh, about tasting, about smelling, and uh, if you have like three, four, five uh, different barrels, it, it might come something really nice from that. Yeah, and that it, that's it, that's a hundred percent true. Um, when we sit down to do um, blendings, I like to try to get um, as many people that are around and willing to to join us on the on the blending sample to try to get as many pallets as possible. Even pallets, we we did a blending um with another local um winemaker um not too long ago because it just to get different different um palettes different ideas um different opinions on different blends is is super helpful um Man, this and, this is really nice a really nice uh tip for us because it's not just you uh there is a, a different uh, interpretations right different feelings different People feel different. This is really great. Uh, I'm happy for having you tonight. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, and and it's you know usually you know drinking is, is kind of when you're having a, a good beer like that, a barrel aged beer. You know that that you know for example we you know generally brew well over a year before it's in bottles. We sit on it for three or four months sometimes before we even release it. Um, those bottles aren't necessarily cheap. Um, so usually when you're buying them, you're, you're enjoying them with someone else. So you're, you know, you kind of want to create that same setting that you enjoy it in as you're, as you're putting it, as you're putting it together. Um, and for us, you know, we have now about 60 plus barrels to choose from when it comes to blending. Um, and, and blending is really, it, it, it's not necessarily just, you know, what flavors go together, but you kind of have to use your, your brewing sense too, and know that, you know, if you have a beer that, that is pretty high in gravity um, and you have another barrel that's low in gravity, they both have bugs, they both um, have bacteria. And if you blend a beer that says finishes at like 1010 and another beer that finishes at like 1005 or 1003 or even lower, closer to one, um, and you blend those together and carb them and put them in a bottle, that um, the bacteria in that beer that finished drier, that finished lower, is going to start working on the, the sugars in that, that higher finishing beer. And then, of course, that will create sort of a, a bottle bomb. Um, yeah. And that bottle will probably That's explode. really dangerous, right? <laughs> yeah. And so you, you, you kind of you, you have to uh, both use your palate and kind of use your, your, your senses about, you know, what tastes great, um, but also, you know, what, what is actually practical, which barrels can you, can you use, which ones have um, similar bacteria. Um, in our case, pretty much every single barrel has a different set of bacteria. Um, and so that way, even if we brew the same beer, we put them into the four of the same Chardonnay barrels, they're all going to come out a little different. Um, and that's again, just to, you don't want to put all of your eggs in one basket. The last thing you want to do is brew a beer, um, sit on it for a year. And then you have four or five barrels and you taste them and you're like, Oh, all these are taste the same and all of them taste bad. <laughs> uh, and so part of, part of uh, brewing sour beers like this is you, you have to be okay with the fact that. Um, some of these barrels aren't going to be any good, um, and you might have to just dump them down the drain. Um, we we budget, you know, a fairly high percentage of our uh, beer and barrels to not ever, you know, see the light of day. Um, but that's just the way you, you're taking you're taking risks, um, and that's you know, hopefully it's some of those risks pay off into some some pretty great beers. So when you are working with wood and bugs, uh, you are, you are not able to be sure what is going to happen and this is this is hard for home brewers because uh, you have how, how many barrels do you have uh we probably about 65 total okay yeah my uh, i as a home brewer i have just one so i have i still have one at home too <laughs> yeah. that's really hard to 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 use barrels as a home brewer a yeah home brewer. It, 
It, it, it really is. And sometimes I wonder if it, if it's worth it, um, as a home brewer, um, um, just because of the, you know, blending is such a big, you know, I don't think there's probably, you know, I don't want to speak for any of the, of the big, um, sour beer brewers out there, but I doubt there's a lot of them that are, that are not blending a lot of their sour beers. Um, and if you're a home brewer and you have one barrel and you, you pitch dregs from one of your, you know, five of your favorite, um, sour beer bottles, you know, you swirl the dregs up and, and toss them into the barrel. Whatever happens to that barrel is, is what that's all you have. You have no other real components to work with. And also once you add bacteria to a barrel, I mean, it's, it's going to be in there forever. It kind of lives in that wood. So even if you hot rinse it, yeah, it, you're, it's probably going to, the next batch is probably going to come out fairly similar. So, um, I think home brewers probably could, could get better results by using, uh, carboys and brewing, you know, five or six different, uh, 20 liter batches and then, um, throwing in, um, different, different bacteria into each one of those carboys and then throwing in, um, wood chips. Um, so you still get that barrel flavor or barrel kind of character. Um, but you also have, you know, blending options if you want. Um, and if one of those five carboys turns out amazing, then you can always take those, that blend of yeast and, and use it for your next batch. And then, um, if you make one or two like really good, uh, mixed firm, um, beers like that, then, then you can feel comfortable using that set of bacteria to inoculate a barrel because you're, you know, it's going to make some good beer and then, and then it's, it's a little bit, uh, more worth your while. Uh, th that's a really nice tip again. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, yesterday we talked about how different is using just, uh, wood chips or wood cubes. Uh, and the barrel because we have the uh, effect of oxygen. Uh, in the barrel, you have the oxygen going through the wall, the, the wood wall, and mm -hmm. it can have uh, some difference when you have Britannomyces. Uh, Britannomyces can make acetic acid if uh, there is some oxygen going on. And it's good for, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, red flanders because you expected that and if you don't have these bugs uh you can uh you want to make this a stride wood flavor uh russian imperial stout uh even in this case the oxygen can help because uh it makes some uh, oxidations reaction to make this cherry like aroma but I, I think you can have the same effect using the wood chips or uh, cubes or sp spirals. Uh, I have a, 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 plastic bar a plastic fermenter, which I open often to go oxygen goes in and it works pretty good for me. Yeah. I mean, I, I think what you said is, is really true. And, and, you know, a lot of times too, the home brewers have much smaller barrels. Um, and so the smaller the barrel, the more oxygen it is kind of um, finding its way into that beer. Um, and so if you have a carboy, you have a rubber stopper on there uh, or a silicone stopper and an airlock. And that's, you know, that's not letting hardly any, any oxygen through. Um, and so I, especially on the smaller scale, I, I, I like the idea of, of um, barrel aged beers or I mean, sour mixed firm beer sitting in, in, in carboys and that's that's how i mostly did it um at, at home and, you know I, I wouldn't throw them into a keg because um over time that especially when it's sitting warm that bacteria is going to keep working and you're going to just build way too much pressure up um but i mean you can have great results at home with it with a barrel um but it's it's just it's a big commitment when you, you might have to brew three batches to fill it um and again, you're kind of just, you're, you're stuck with, with, with whatever you get, but yeah, multiple, you get a little less oxygen pick, you're getting less oxygen pick up in those, in those carboys. You can throw different, you know, play what you were saying earlier with all the great woods you have, um, in Brazil, you can put different woods in each one of those barrels. Um, and just you have a little more fun it, being a little more experimental. And I, I think that's, that's probably, uh, the approach I would take if I were brewing, um, sour beers at home right now. That's nice. Uh, we have this company here in Brazil uh, selling the, all kinds of uh, woods for for home brewing, 
and some small dices, like one by one by one centimeter, uh, centimeters. Okay. Uh, and it's really good because it's uh, really cheap and you have like a thousand cubes for experiment with uh, every wood you can think. Uh, people are asking here, uh, what kind of woods do you use uh, in your brewery? Mo mostly we're just using uh, like American or French oak. Um, we we, you know, we don't have as many experimental woods that you have. In fact, I think that company that you were just uh, talking about um, is might have been what I brought home. It was like a, a gift set or it was a box that had, I don't know, 15 different Brazilian woods in it, little cubes. Yeah, with uh, 100 uh, cubes per, per pack. Yeah, it was, I remember it was like 60 grams or something like that per. And um, so I was using them in some small batch testing. Um, but for the wood that we're using here, yeah, I mean, it's pretty much just, you know, we're using American wine barrels or, or um, bourbon or whiskey barrels. You know, fun thing about this company, uh, you can use the uh, woods for trying beers, uh, try, uh, to make some experiments. And if you like a blend of wood, like 50% uh, Emburana, 50% uh, Jequitiba, you can order a wood barrel made with these two woods in this propor proportion. And they'll actually give you a, a barrel with it and not just the... Yeah, a barrel. Oh, that's neat. You can use three, four woods in a barrel. Yeah, I, I think that, like you were saying, I just think if I were if I were where you are right now, I would be having so much fun with all those those different woods and i and i think that's the a big advantage you have that that and the fruits that you um that you are able to to source there um so you guys can do you can do a lot of fun things that not a lot of other uh brewers around the world can can do yeah th that's that's the point i think our fruits and and woods uh are are something unique like you have hops really good hops Mm -hmm. Oh God, how good is your hops? <laughs> They're pretty good. <laughs> but we don't have those hops here. <laughs> But have and, that's, nice and, that's, and that's our advantage. And so, you know, it, it, advantage if you want to look at it that way. But it, it's just what we have access to. Um, and so that's, you know, a lot of uh, American hoppy beers is, is one of the biggest, um, you know, styles in the, in the country right now by far. Um, but when I was, you know, lucky enough to be be with you in in Brazil, um, I, I had a a cashew goza, and I remember that I haven't had anything like that before. Um, and so those are just the, some of the fun stuff that you that that you have access to that I, I wish we could source here. Are, are you coming to Brazil again? Uh, it's it's yeah, probably very likely. Uh, uh, someday, right? When yeah, all this stuff's Talk I've been uh, to talking that, to that meeting, uh, the national uh, meeting, home brewery meeting. Remember? Yeah, but is that still going on? I'm not sure if that yeah, got canceled. I, I, I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, let's see some questions here. Sure. Uh, in which temperature do you age your beer, from Matheus? Um, so our our sour. All of our barrels are sitting, let's see, I got to look at my conversion chart here, but so most of them, so we're about 68 to 70 degrees. So a little, little over or under 20 uh, degrees Celsius. Yeah. Do you think it's not good to age this beer like in a uh, uh, hundred Fahrenheit? <laughs> I think, yeah, I think it, it's important to try to avoid extreme temperature changes with the barrels. Um, so we, we have a, uh, air conditioned room that the barrels are in, so we, we can keep it from getting, um, too hot, but in the summer, it is going to be a little warmer than it is in the winter. And, and sometimes we'll see a little bit more, uh, pickup of, of different flavors and activity in those barrels as the, as the temperature gets a little warmer, sometimes maybe the Brett or the PDO is getting a little more active. Um, but for the most part, we try to keep it a pretty pretty steady temperature. Um, the clean barrels, so if we have just a sack barrel with a uh, Saccharomyces barrel with, you know, an Imperial Stout, um, you know, we, I think Mike and I both agree that we like to keep those as low as possible. I know, I know some 
Um, some breweries will even put those, uh, you know, like a bourbon barrel with uh, Imperial Stout in, you know, a cold room um, for extended aging. Uh, do you remember Febrisani? She is asking if you like better uh, beer or wine. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes <laughs> it's funny. Um, <laughs> Well, if you're around beer all day, sometimes, and you talk about it all day, sometimes, yeah, a glass of wine is kind of nice. <laughs> Preferably a, a, a weird, weird natural wine. Not, not uh, with wood? Uh, yeah, uh, natural wines are, are, are similar to like a sour beer. So um, they're, the winemakers don't pitch yeast. Um, they're using oh, the nice. native. We have yeah. this kind of wine here in my area, but... Uh... I don't think it's really good. <laughs> <laughs> Most of them are kind of sour. And... Yeah, it, I mean that's kind of the fun of it. Is it they're they're so different. Yeah. Um, so we, yeah, we yeah. Some of them. It, uh, colonial wine here. Colony wine. <laughs> well, keep trying them. You'll you'll find a good one eventually. I, I promise. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's try. Uh, uh, let's see uh, another question. Uh, okay, this one. Uh, how big uh, is your? Uh, how many gallons do you brew there? Uh, uh, so we do. Um, we have our hot side stuff is uh, 310 gallons. So that's that's 10 barrels, um, <laughs> and I think that's 12 hectoliters. Okay, uh, 1,200 um, liters. What's that? Uh, uh, thousand, uh, thousand two hundred liters. Is yeah. It? Yep. And so we'll, we'll brew most of our, um, tanks, um, we'll brew once in a day to fill them. Um, we do have, um, some bigger tanks that are like, that are coming that we'll have to brew twice into. And then we have, um, I don't know if you can see the tanks behind me, but the biggest one back there, we brew twice in one day to, to fill. Those are our double batches. So generally we're doing, um, double batches of, uh, double IPA. So we just did, uh, a couple days ago, we brewed, uh, twice to fill it. And that was, uh, it's going to be a hollow tower Blanc, um, mosaic, uh, Nelson, I believe double IPA. Um, and so those go so fast here. We, we, we had a release, uh, a couple weeks ago, um, of a double IPA and a big variant of it. And, um, it lasted about two and a half, three days, and then all the cans were gone. So now we have to wait another four weeks to uh, for the for the new one to to come out and get canned, and hopefully that sticks around a little longer. All, all those sour beers, uh, you can them or bottle them? Um, so we do all of our so all of our clean um, hoppy beers. Those um, generally we're usually just serving it out of the tasting room. Um, but since the tasting room is is closed now and it's all just uh, to go pick up stuff, we we can everything. Um, all the sour beer we we um, take out of barrels and we put into we have a sour blending tank. So none of our beer that's sour, none of the gaskets, none of the valves, they never touch the stuff that touches the clean beer. So everything is completely separate. Um, all the tubing and everything is separate. Um, and so we'll take everything out of the barrels. We'll blend, say, two or three barrels together to make, um, you know, one beer. We'll put it in a blending tank, add a uh, sugar and water solution, usually some wine yeast to kind of help it um, help it referment because that's, you know, a pretty, um, pretty rough environment for yeast. It's sometimes high alcohol. Um, it's, it's really dry and um, uh, really acidic. And so, like, just Saccharomyces strains are, are going to struggle to, um, to to really grab a hold of those sugars and, and, and carbonate the bottle. Um, and so, we'll we then bottle off of that blending tank. We just have a forehead uh, counter pressure bottle bottle filler. Um, and so, uh, Mike and I and um, uh, Ken, one of our, our brewers, will will all day. We just sit there um, one at a time, putting bottles on. They fill from the bottom up. We cap them, and then we then put them on a, a labeler that we do one at a time too. So it's it's usually a full day. Each bottling run is usually a, a full day, um, but it yeah. but it works great because it, that counter pressure filler means um, that it's it, it creates a seal on that bottle, 
and it is, first it purges it with CO2 and then it creates a seal and then it transfers the beer in while slowly releasing um, uh, gas into there's a little blow off bucket and then it has an automatic top up. So once if there's a little foam or whatever, it just keeps keeps spitting a little more beer in while it's under pressure and then you have to release it and then you can cap it really quick. So it, it works pretty well because we're you're always worried about oxygen intake at all stages in, in brewing. Um, but with sour beers, little oxygen late in the game can create what's called THP, which is a very like cereal kind of taste um, that just lingers really aggressively um, in your mouth. And so we'll, in that, that'll go away with time in a sour beer. It'll kind of work itself out. But, you know, we'd rather not sit on a beer another um, six months or so. And so we do our best to try to keep uh, the oxygen um, intake as low as possible. Yeah, you, you are not a really big fan of oxygen, right? No, I don't think any brewer should be, unless you're pitching yeast. That's the only time. <laughs> okay, let's see an, uh, other questions uh, before we, uh, we keep going. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I, I have this one. Using the same base in the same barrel, one can expect a different beer? Uh, yeah. I, th I think, hey, man, exactly. uh, you have this barrel, put the beer and take off the beer and put the beer again. Is this? Is using uh, I think if I understood that question, it was more of if you if you brew the same base and you put it into four beer uh, barrels, um, you can get a different a different tasting beer just by the ba uh, the bacteria that you put into each one of those barrels. Um, so for in our case, if let's say uh, we have like a, a bottle share or something. And, you know, you, you take some of the, the dregs from the, the bacteria from the barrels you really like um, and you put them into one barrel and you do the same for another barrel. You know, after eight or 10 months, they're going to they're going to taste different because um, they, they both have a different set of, of bacteria working and they're all going to do different things with all the compounds in, in the beer. Um, so it is possible, yeah, to take the same base beer, put it into, you know, two Chardonnay barrels and get something get something different. Uh, I have uh, Fernando asking, what was the cra uh, what was the craziest beer with wood did you uh, ever make? Was this the, good? The craziest beer that we've ever done with wood? Yeah. Um, I guess, you know, we play it kind of safe here at the brewery um, just because you have to sell it, right? So you can't <laughs> go too crazy. Yeah. Um, but But we do a lot of uh, a lot of fruit additions after. So let's say a beer sits on um, wood for uh, you know a year, a little over a year. Then we'll um, oftentimes, if you know if it's cherry season, then we'll we'll go out and go to a local farm and just get you know a couple hundred pounds of of cherries, and then we'll you know wrap the beer out of the barrels and let it sit for another you know three or four months on cherries with wine yeast and and. Um, potentially even um, some enzymes that you can use in the hop world to to the free additional compounds from the from the fruit, um, and those are some of my favorite beers that we do. It's those you know you know wine barrel age mixed fermentations um, sour beers that are you know a little funky, a little strange, um, but then you know get layered with some you know bright big bright um, fresh fruit flavors late in the game right before you package them. I think those are those are some of my favorite. And Saul is asking, uh, our brewery has this uh, main main beer, uh, which is, uh, what is your main beer? What is the beer you most sell? Uh, you know, I think in our first year, you know, we brewed over 100, maybe 150 different beers if you count um, variants. Um, so it's, it's kind of rare that we're really brewing the same beer um, over and over. Um, We have a, a beer called uh, Rings of Light, which is just an all citra hazy uh, session. It's like a 4.8 or so percent um, all citra hoppy beer um, that drinks a lot lot more like a big IPA. And it's um, that's one that we've we've brewed. Uh, I think we just brewed the fifth batch of it, and that might be the one we brewed the most of. Um, and then, you know, it's partly that you know, Mike. Mike and I are home brewers at heart, and we we just love trying new things. Um, And it's also kind of what uh, at least uh, consumers in the U.S. have been um, kind of telling us is, you know, they come in and they're like, hey, what's new? I want to try, you know, whatever's new. And and so that kind of works for us because that's 
kind of what we like doing anyway. So this is your business model, right? Yeah. Yeah. They... That's that's really nice. Uh, uh, last question before we keep going. Uh, what's uh, what kind of beers have the best results in barrels? Um, for us, a lot of the the sour beers um, that we'll put into barrels that that turn out pretty great. Um, we'll we'll do some um, we'll do a dark saison every year. Um, we'll do like a a uh, sometimes we'll even throw in like like a, a pale saison. They do well in in, in like a chardonnay barrel or something. Um, Flanders red um, we love doing nice. those. Yeah, there's the the little bit of um, malty sort of uh, it's it. The malt flavor kind of turns into like this fruity character over time, and with a little bit of funk, those beers just turn out turn out amazing, uh, and they're really good bases for for fruit too. Um, we don't do a lot of like like stout type beers in in barrels for aging with um, with sour bugs. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of too Is much. Is this because uh, do you guys use this uh, wine barrels? Um, you know, we'll, we have a lot of like uh, whiskey or bourbon barrels too, um, but it's just, you know, if you have a really roasty beer and it gets really acidic and sour, um, it's some, it's really just not the greatest combination. Um, and a lot of times, you know, a big imperial stout is really sweet. It finishes pretty high. Um, and, you know, Brett and bacteria is going to, you know, do a lot to bring that gravity down and make it drier and, and a little maybe thinner on the palate. Um, so, you know, it, it, you can, there are some styles that work, uh, pretty good with, with dark beers and, and bacteria, but, um, it's just, it, we don't have a lot of those here. Um, we stick mostly to, um, you know, little maltier beers, um, and, um, you know, like lambic type stuff. It really, you're trying to, trying to create as much variety as you can. So we kind of have, you know, a handful of different styles in, in barrels and, and we'd probably have a lot more if we had more space for them, but we're just, we're running out of room for, for, our, um, barrels. Uh, I think myself that uh, pretty much any beer can have the uh, this uh, wood character. Uh, you can have uh, just the wood or the bugs, but uh, I can have a, a lager uh, with oak. It's it, it tastes good. Uh, yeah, but I have never had a, a wood aged IPA. Have you ever ha uh, done something like this? Because you are from IPAs. <laughs> yeah, Michael, <that's> right. <laughs> this bugs. And, uh, as well, I have never had uh, a good sour IPA. I, I, I don't like sour IPAs. I think I, I probably would not like this woody IPAs too. What do you think about this? Um, you know, yeah, we haven't done a lot of that. Um... We we have done like a uh, like a cedar a Spanish cedar I believe that we put into a you know kind of has a grapefruit type of flavor so that can kind of work um, in a hoppy beer. Um, I know that I've, I've had some some pretty good uh, like pale ale type beers that actually get aged in um, barrels um, with bacteria for a while and and those can actually be kind of fun. I know Hill Farmstead has a handful of those in there. Um, they're really great, but I don't know exactly um, how and when they're adding the the hops and if they're dry hopping early and they're and they're hoping the the Brett does uh, works on some of those hop compounds over time or if they you know give it a dry hop right before packaging or what. But um, it can be done, but it it is tricky and it's it's a little clash of flavors sometimes. That's nice. Uh, let Let's stop. Uh, oh, Rodrigo asked, dry hop the sours. Yeah. <laughs> is it possible right yeah we, we've a lot of breweries do uh dry hop sours um a lot of times we, we've done only one sour ipa here and usually if you if you do a sour ipa um that means you have to do a kettle sour um so that means you are adding the lactobacillus in the kettle in the boil kettle um and letting Before it add in the hops yeah so you yeah. you have to let it get um um, get to a low pH, say three two, three three, or something, 
And then you can heat up that kettle again, kill off that kills the lactose. So you don't have the live culture anymore, but, but then you can, um, do a, you know, heat the beer back up and do like a, a full whirlpool to get hot flavors in like you would for an IPA. Um, that's the only way you can do it. Cause if you did the whirlpool first, uh, there'd be too many, um, alpha acids into that beer. And I summarized, um, alpha acids that the lacto would be prevented from doing anything. Um, so it has to be a, a kettle sour, which which doesn't excite me as much as as one that's still kind of a, a living creature that still kind of can um, be active. Um, but you can still dry hop, um, dry hop those beers. Um, I I might I guess this is just my opinion, but a lot of times when I taste um, dry hop beers, uh, especially uh, dry hop sour beers, especially mixed firm um, sour beers, I can't pick out the hop variety as much. Um, it just, they seem to kind of like, if it's Citra or Galaxy or Columbus, um, I, I, it's kind of smells and, and tastes the same to me, but that just, that just might be my, um, my, my palate. It, to me, it kind of, it has like this, uh, Pez candy flavor, no matter what the variety is. Um, so I, I, I like it, I, I like it, but it's, um, it's just a different, you don't get a, such a varietal sense with each, um, hop as you would in a clean, um, hoppy beer. But that's not to say it's not something to, to try and um, and something you'll enjoy. Again, thank you for all the things you are saying to us. It's really <laughs> nice. Uh, can we keep going? Uh, in in uh, his book, I'm sorry. In his book, Michael has uh, uh, a lot of examples of doing sour beers from other breweries in the US, like uh -huh. Russian River and Allagash and like there, there are like the, the, the dozens of examples here. Uh, are you, uh, can you say for us uh, how is the process in, in your brewery? What do you do with the barrel, sanitization process? Uh, you, you, you start to to talk about this in the beginning of our stream, right? But mm -hmm. how do you do you do the, these things the, uh, in the brewery? Um, you know, we kind of, you know, like I said earlier, we kind of just start with with a new barrel. And if sometimes we'll rinse them. Um, we don't. There's not really a great way to, to to sanitize it, at least not with the equipment we have. Um, and you know, we're, you're pitching bacteria in it anyways. Um, but, so, uh, I'm sorry, uh, do you guys, uh, fill up the barrel with hot water or something like this? Uh, on some of the beers, it just kind of depends on, on what we're looking for. If we're doing like a, a pale, um, lambic style beer, um, and we have, we have fresh wine barrels or something, we'll, we'll fill those with hot water first. Um, sometimes we'll just go right in. Um, we'll, That's we'll get nice. a brand new barrel and we'll, you know, we'll transfer in as, as quickly as we can. Um, after we take a beer out of a barrel, so we have a barrel tool that, um, allows you to create a seal on the barrel and, and then you can put a, a sight glass on there, um, and some valves, and then you can transfer out with, um, CO2 pressure. Um, you can't use a lot of pressure. You'll, you'll blow up the barrel, the barrel, but just enough to, to push the liquid out. Um, After we do that, we'll we'll take the barrels um, off, and we have a, a barrel rinser, um, and it's basically like a pipe that you can flip the barrel onto, I, and then it. I think I have some pictures here. Uh, can you see it on YouTube? Oh, you sent some pictures for me this afternoon. Is, well, let's see. is this what we were talking about? Um, right now, I still see myself talking, so maybe I'm just okay. a little behind. But the, I'll wait till 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 it comes up here. There, there is like a minute to delay. Um, well, when it when it comes up, I'll, I'll. Oh yeah, there we go. Yeah, so that's that's our barrel removing tool there. Um, okay, I'm so sorry. You can, sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you can see it 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 screws down into the there's uh, like a rubber. Um, end that screws down and then um, you can that creates a seal and then you can just hook co2 right up to that um, and you'll see we have it teed off um, at the very start there and that is so you can actually um, purge the entire thing with co2 
um, when you're um, taking beer um, out of barrels. Because if you stick just a, a barrel tool into a, a barrel full of beer, there's oxygen inside that, um, you know, the, the actual transfer tool. So it's, we try our, do our best to, to purge everything just like you would, uh, you know, purging a keg for a clean hoppy beer. Um, and so we'll push it out with that into a tank and then we'll, we'll then flip that barrel over, drain it out. Um, and then we have a barrel uh, rinsing tool that we, we can sit it on and, it's, and we hook a pump up to it and just pump like 170 degree water, um, really hard through that barrel. And it just, it's almost like doing a CIP on a tank. It just gets all the old yeast out. Um, and that's, it gets yeast out and it's a hot water can kind of knock the bugs down a little bit if it's, if it's getting too aggressive. But it's 70 degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit? Uh, so that's like usually around 170 degrees Celsius. So that's, uh, or I mean, I'm sorry, Fahrenheit. So that is about okay. around 80 degrees Celsius. Nice, nice. Yeah. Um, and so then we'll, we'll just, uh, after we rinse the barrel out, um, we, we almost never will empty barrels unless we have beer that's ready to go right back into them that same day. Okay. Um, you, you keep the barrels, uh, filled up for not drying out, right? Yep, absolutely. And you don't want any, you know, bacteria or any, anything growing in that barrel that, that you didn't purposely put in there. Um, so we'll, we'll rinse the barrel, um, flip it back over and then we'll, uh, purge it with CO2 again just like we did the first time we filled it. And then we uh, you know, rack beer into it um, and then put a waterless airlock on and just kind of let it be for, for six months or so before we start checking in on them. Um, we generally put a, a nail into the side of each one so you can just pull the nail out of the head and then you can get a little sample and then you just put the nail back in. And that's, that's how we taste taste the beers and, and how we, you know, come up with blends and stuff. You just, uh, um, pull them out of the head like that. Um, we, the other thing that I think is kind of important is we do top ups. Um, so okay. when we brew, that, that's really important. Yeah. So when we brew, you know, a, a batch, we'll put most of that into barrels and then we will then also put a good chunk of it just into kegs, like the kegs that are behind me here. Um, and then we'll use that, we'll use that beer say six months down the line to pump back into those barrels. Um, so we can keep them as full as possible to try to keep that, the oxygen down. Um, generally, you know, we'll over the course of like four, four months or so, and you'll see, you know, up to you know, three gallons or more that just kind of evaporates. They call that the angel share. Um, and so we try to keep those topped up. Um, you just have to be careful if you primary the beer with, with bacteria, um, you're not going to want to put them into barrels. You're going to want to put them into some sort of fermenter so that um, as those bugs continue to work, that it, the pressure has somewhere to go. So we'll only do the top up beer if it's a clean, clean beer going into the barrel. Uh, I just, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, is the juice on asking if you have some specific method to clean up the barrels like chains? Have you ever heard about it? Uh, chains, chains. Uh, I think it's chains, like the, uh, like Alice in Chains. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, yeah, I guess I'm not from, familiar with that. I'm, I, I'm sure it is a thing. I just that's not you know something that we do. <laughs> okay, how long does the beer uh, stays in the barrel uh, in your brewery? Um, usually at least a year. Um, oh, but we at least we a still year. have. Oh man. Yeah. And most of it, um, you know, we'll, we'll do Lambic stuff that'll sit for, you know, up to three years. Um, so then we'll be able to do a, a, a true, uh, a goose type blend where you have a blend of year one, year two and year three, um, beer. And nice. so you, yeah. And so it's, it's kind of tricky cause you want to, you kind of want to keep, you want to use and put and sell the, the barrels that are really tasting great and coming along, but you also, you don't know if it's going to continue to evolve and get even better. Um, so you just, you sit on some as long as you can and, and, and hope that they um, just continue to improve. But it's, it's just part of the, the fun of sour beers is you just don't know exactly where they're going to go. Um, and so that's why we just try to have as many barrels with as many different bugs and as many different base beers as possible. Because you can blend together beers of two different bases. I mean, you can blend, a, you know, a, 
like a more of a like a red base beer with you know a pale beer um you just have to make sure that those gravities are are um, kind of in the same ballpark and and you have to take account for those kind of things but um but we just like we didn't like the idea of throwing all of our eggs in one basket so we want as many options as possible when it comes to our sour beer <laughs> that's crazy man and do do you guys reuse the barrel Yep, we reuse um, pretty much every every barrel, and we'll just continue to keep using them. Um, But do, some... do you guys do that? Uh, I don't know how to say this in English. Uh, clean up the the surface and shark again. Uh, I mean, we just do like a heavy, heavy rinse, um, and then fill, and then we'll just you know hose off the outside of the barrel, and then put it back on the rack, and and you know forklift it into place, and that's about all. That's about all we do right now, um, and we'll use these barrels indefinitely. I mean, okay, if you use a, a barrel for a year, indefinitely is like 10 years. It's just 10 beers. <laughs> yeah, we will just keep we'll keep using them. Um, the the one caveat is though, if if a if a barrel is you know produces well, a beer that's not any good, then but, we'll we'll reti we'll tire that barrel and get it out. The most uh, the most important thing for you guys is not the wood character itself as the bugs and the interaction with the wood but not like this pungent intense aroma of oak yeah that's that's exactly right and a lot of times we look for more of a, a neutral um neutral barrels which, which nice. you get maybe a little bit of, of barrel kind of wood character yes. but it's just kind of a it's it's a complexity more than a, a dominant flavor that's the reason you guys can reuse this much the barrels because you don't need this wood character that yep. really clar clarifying yeah exactly the more the more you use it um the more let's say you put three beers through a, a white wine barrel the, the more neutral that barrel becomes in terms of its you know the whiny grapeness or uh you know butteriness or, or whatever depending on the wine is going to be um it's much more subdued with each batch that that goes into that barrel good is matthews asking again uh probably you you talk about this but uh, the bugs are from the barrels or you you add the bugs in the barrels we add uh manually add all the bugs um and that can be in uh, various forms so sometimes we'll um, primary the beer we have one stainless tank back here that is a sour tank that we'll actually throw bacteria into so sometimes we'll buy a commercial pitch of uh something that has you know brett and pedio um, and lacto in it um, mike himself has a his own mad fermentation um saison yeast strain that um, wow. also has bugs in it um nice. that you that uh bootleg biology carries um so we'll do we'll throw that in there sometimes too but we'll also just do like what homebrewers do and we'll use dregs from sour beers that we really like that we'll pour right into a barrel um and sometimes if like if a barrel is really banging like we we just really like the flavors that are coming out of a barrel then we'll take five gallons of that and we'll pitch it into a um fresh ferment of a beer you know that we'll brew 10 barrels of um, so we'll take five barrels from that, that, um, five gallons, I'm sorry, from the barrel that's, you know, really tasting good, primary it with a whole new batch. And then that's like the base bugs for that batch. So we, we think it's going to turn out pretty good just because that, the barrel that, that, that previously, um, that beer was fermented with turned out great. And then we'll put that beer into barrels and then we'll still add probably new, um, bugs to some of those barrels. Um, I think this is a, a really nice way to see beer and it's uh, different because uh, you are not sure what uh, expect and if there is something good uh, you can keep using this. This is uh, like the uh, old people did <laughs> in the past and this is the, the way that uh, the Uh, bugs or saccharomyces evolved uh, yeah it's it's kind of like a it's like a more uh, romantic way to make beer in a way because it can be really frustrating and it can be really rewarding and you know it takes a lot of time it takes a lot of effort um, 
but it's it's different than making like I, I feel like we can make a pretty solid hazy hoppy beer pretty much every time we try it um it's just there's a there's a kind of a science to it we'll play with different things of course but um we pretty much know what we're gonna get um when we're doing that but when it comes to some of these sour beers you know sometimes you'll pull a sample eight months in and you'll just like you big smile on your face like wow this is awesome and then the next barrel you pull a sample from you're like oh god <laughs> this is <laughs> this better turn a corner um but that's that's kind of the fun of it and um and that's just what you know time time does amazing things in barrels um and bacteria with time is um can can really um do some create some fun flavors and um and if you have the patience and the and the ability and luxury of of really pulling different barrels together to blend i think that's when you can make some outstanding beer okay let's go for our last rounds of uh questions uh uh, I thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's Absolutely. it's been really nice to to see the things as you guys see, and uh, it's the exactly it's exactly what I don't do here. I use the wood in a, uh, in another way, which is uh, good too. Uh, but uh, I must try this way. <laughs> you just you're gonna have to get a big warehouse to put all those barrels but yeah. in the meantime i think you're i think you're doing it right okay let, let's see uh, the questions we have here uh edilson is asking if you have no uh, uh physical way to clean the barrels is just the the water uh there there is n like the belgian cleaning process uh, there is nothing beside rinsing, and not not even a, a, another a, a physical process of uh, cleaning. Yeah, I mean, we'll we don't have. I think you can sometimes use like steam or something to really uh, clean out a barrel. But um, like I said, if you if you get it and it smells like you know fresh good wine, or if it's you know, sometimes like a bourbon barrel, the, the environment in, a, in the bourbon barrel is, you know, the alcohol is so high. It's not, you know, there's not a lot that's really growing in there if you, if you get it pretty fresh. Um, and, you know, sometimes you, maybe it'll backfire and a, and a barrel will turn out kind of bad, but um, that's just kind of the way it is. But yeah, for the most part, we're just doing hot water rinses. Um, we do use a pump and pump, um, pump water through a, a rinser that's just like a spray ball that sprays inside the barrel so it really cleans it out well it gets it pretty hot um in general sometimes we'll, we'll let that barrel cool down a little before we fill it again or you'll just get a lot of foaming when the colder beer from a tank tries to hit that barrel but but yeah we're just we're just using uh some some hot water to to clean these barrels um uh, in between each each run Nice. You have uh, John asking about um, if you have a special malt grist and mm, mm, maceration technique for wood aged sours. I think uh, your your friend Michael talk about it a lot here in the uh, the book. But what do you do in the brewery about uh, the, the malt and the process? Uh, it's you know it's, the malts are are going to be pretty different um, depending on the the style of beer that we're putting into the barrel. Um, in fact, a lot of the the, the the recipes we're using for these barrel aged beers are are ones that Mike's done um, before and, and wrote about. So if you check out uh, the madfermentations.com, he has a, a list of all the beers he's done in the past, um, and a lot of those I think he puts stars or something um, next to the ones he really likes. But those are the ones that. Um, that we'll still, you know, we do a little variations of them, but for the most part, um, there's, there's pretty solid recipes for creating like a, a, you know, whatever type of beer you're after, but it's, you know, usually a lot of, uh, Pilsner malt in, in these beers that are going to be, um, like, you know, like a lambic base. Um, and we'll usually boil a little longer because of that, um, you know, 75, 90 minutes, to try to get the DMS out. Um, but again, it just, it really depends on the style. Uh, and that is, is kind of, we, we still play with malts, um, yeah. quite a bit, uh, different, different beers. And, and in a lot of ways, you, you just want to create a good base. You don't want to go too crazy with these because, you know, like we were saying earlier, so much of the flavor is coming from, from the time. 
Yeah, and that. Th this is a, a trick question because you have uh, the the particularity of every beer. But uh, if I remember, I, I read this book like a couple years ago. Uh, Michael uh, talks here ab uh, about uh, letting some fermentable uh, for the bugs to to consume. I, I think the the question was in in that way. You can do this. You can make uh, a less fermentable uh, for sac for saccharomyces uh, using a higher temperature for mashing or using this uh, other grains like crystal malt. Uh, but it, it's it's just one part of the the whole picture. Because you can have this residual sugar, which bread can uh, use and have this nice bread character. But it, when we are talking about bread, not all your uh, beers use bread, right? Yeah, not most of them that are in barrels do. Um, but yeah, none of our none of our like hoppy, you know, IPAs those those generally don't. Um, but you're right. Yeah. You want to, a lot of times, you know, you're thinking about what you want in that beer. Um, so if you're going to put together a grist for a beer that's going into barrels for a long time and you want it to be sour. Um, so you're going to want to say, okay, if it's one, if I want it to be sour and I'm going to use lacto, I'm going to, I want to keep those IBUs down. Um, or if you're going to be pitching, you're trying to get a lot of the sourness from, um, PDO, then you're going to want to leave, um, some, um, uh, some some dextrins behind for that to work on as it sits in the barrel um so you know for example we will ferment sometimes a primary uh, ferment in stainless with a wine yeast that leaves the beer really sweet um you know 10 10 30 or something um going into barrels but then when it comes out of barrels you know the after it the the pdo works on it gets sour it really starts to dry that beer out a little more um and so yeah you can use you know you could even throw like a bag of uh maltodextrin or something, or not a whole bag for a home brewer, but, but something to add a lot of dextrins um, that the primary yeast won't work on, but over time the, the bacteria can work on. Um, and so it's, it's, you just really have to kind of, kind of know what the end goal is that you're, you're looking for and then try to tailor, tailor your, your recipe for it. But um, it, it can be tricky because if you, like, for example, we, we just did a, like a, imperial uh flanders red kind of in, based off the rodenbach and the cereal um and i think that was like 12 percent going into barrels and that's pretty sweet still so like it, it's going to be a pretty high alcohol beer but it's also that's a rough environment for even bacteria to to do its thing so we're you know a little worried that it might not sour um how we uh, as much as we want because it's a really high alcohol there's a lot of factors to to consider when you're when you're putting together your recipe, but then there's always ways to sort of adjust on the fly. So we can always try to blend in something real sour into that, uh, a different really sour beer into um, into that one, for example. I, I, I I'm seeing that blending is the way. <laughs> it's def it's definitely the way. I mean, it's it it's um, it, you have to put a lot. Of, you're relying a lot on your own palate, but um, also you know the the palate of uh, those that you you do the blending sessions with. But yeah, it's it's just hard to make. It's hard to consistently make great sour beer. I, w I would say when if you don't have a lot of a lot of options, it's just like if you're if you're cooking, you know, um, it's it's hard to do a lot with only a few ingredients, right? Um, yeah. It's it, it's easier just to have have more more options in your in your cupboard to to come up with something, and that's kind of the same concept I think for to make uh, sour beers, but it's also just creates a lot of uh, um, coordination, a lot of organization, you know, which every barrel that every barrel we have there's a, a spreadsheet um that says you know when beer, beer went in when it was emptied well what bacteria went in when that bacteria went in you know what it tasted like six months in what the ph was um what the gravity was and um luckily for me mike's really good and organized he does, <laughs> oh, he God, does, that's he good does, <laughs> i do my best to follow follow orders on that stuff but um, but it, it's important to have really good record keeping too, because um, if if a barrel or, or a particular beer turns out great, you're going to want to try your best to, to recreate it, and that's that's tough to do if you don't have um, a good record. 
when I have to say thanks uh, for all the people donating here. Thank you guys, I appreciate that. Mamut Metal, Icaro, uh, is really nice of you guys. Uh, can we buy your beer in Miami? Marcus <laughs> is asking. You know, uh, Brazilian guy, uh, Brazilian people just go to Miami. Yeah, that's what I was told. <laughs> it's just it's the first place you get to, right? So yeah, and I, if it was not for uh, coronavirus, I would be there next month. I would love to go to your brewery, but it's not. Uh, well, it's far from there. One of these days, maybe you'll you'll venture a little further away from Miami, but um, <laughs> yeah. At the time, yeah, all of our beer we sell, um, you know, ninety eight percent of it out of the out of the tasting room. Um, so we don't really distribute oh, anything, man. which is kind of a, a luxury, really, because it's you know we can control the beer until it gets you know handed off to the to the consumer. But um, maybe maybe one day, or maybe he can trade for it. I know that's a thing. If uh, uh, if I rent the, those Amazon boxes, can you ship uh, a beer for me? <laughs> Maybe if it gets through gets through customs. <laughs> okay. Uh, the problem is, uh, I think I'm not going to this states anymore. <laughs> It'll probably be a while until we all travel, which is which is unfortunate. But <laughs> okay, let's see our last question. Uh, I I think it's time. Uh, the dinner is smelling really good here. It, it's hard to keep in, <laughs> in this stream. Uh, let's see, there was from Fernando Dot again. Uh, what do you think about combined chips and uh, spirals with wood barrels to add some extra complexity? Oh, like throwing in a spiral into a barrel? Yeah, uh, I think uh so. Yeah, we've, we've done that once. We did that with uh, Spanish cedar. Um, we threw in a one little uh, chip into a barrel. And that wood is just so strong. It has such a bit high flavor impact that um, that beer was eventually, so that would, that particular beer had wine pumice um, that it aged on. And so that's uh, like the Chardonnay skins were pressed and we went and got them from a, a local winery and then had a lot of... Um, months of skin contact on the wine grapes with our uh, mixed fermented beer. And then after that, that beer went into Chardonnay barrels. Like I think it was three different barrels. Um, one of those barrels then got transferred off onto Cab Franc grapes and that refermented out. And then all three got blended together. So there's a lot going on with that beer. And only one little spiral of Spanish cedar was in one of those barrels. And that was pretty much the dominant flavor for me. Oh. So, that's the reason uh, you don't uh, are concerned about uh, reusing the barrels because you are not looking for this barrel flavor, this wood flavor. This is great. Uh, I, this, I think this is really great. Uh, but, yeah, but it's true. But in some ways, we are looking for it. So, like when we use the Ambrana, which what you guys have, oh, yeah, uh, that's yeah, we wanted that flavor. So we're we're throwing um. Um, we're kind of overdoing it almost because we we want to have that sort of be the, the dominant flavor so and you know it really depends on the beer and the goal but um yeah throwing different wood into a a, a wood barrel is, is definitely a fun thing to do and again it just creates more complexity yeah so uh Ciclo is asking uh what about the market for what about the market for this kind of beer could you give a glimpse of that uh, just sort of like the the appetite for for people here that want it. Yeah, how, how is the wood aged sour beer market going on? You know, it, it we you maybe we're um, a little lucky, but um, we have a a wood club that they pretty much pre buy most of these. So um, before we even go um, public with them, you know, they have you know over half of them are already already purchased. And then when we go to um, sell them to the general public, depending on the beer, they you know will last you know anywhere from a a week to you know a couple months. Um, but we um, will usually sit on a lot of bottles too, because the fun of these is you can um, we'll save like 50 bottles or so from each 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 uh, batch that we will release a few cases of over the course of let's say three to five years. So, you know, three years from now, you can come and get the 2020 vintage of that bottle. Um, 
And so you, you kind of want to sell as many as you can, but you also kind of want to hold on to some for a while too, just to uh, have people come in the tasting room and try them down the road and see how they've evolved. But um, there's definitely a lot of beer drinkers um, that aren't really familiar with, with the, the style and maybe they pick up a bottle that's, you know, fairly expensive and it looks more like a wine bottle and they're a little, little confused saying, you know, this is beer. Um, but there's also, I think the, the beer IQ in, in the U S is, is, is growing all the time. And, um, th it's more of a, you know, kind of a European style. And so it's, it's taking, you know, it's new to a lot of people, but that's, that's kind of the fun. We get to, you know, hopefully introduce a new, a new style to some people. Um, and hopefully, hopefully they dig it and, you know, get get further into it and start buying these from other breweries too so um so there's we're lucky there is definitely a market for it um here but i'm sure it's 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 much much smaller than the the overall beer market that's for sure man thank you so much for joining us tonight it was amazing uh, absolutely i hope you can join us again and this uh, translation tomorrow uh the people keep watching in portuguese after that Thank you so much. <laughs> the, it opened my mind. Thank you for Alexandre for the donation again. Well, thank you, guy, for uh, being nice. <laughs> Any last words? Uh, no, I guess just uh, th great to, to talk to you again. And um, yeah, I'd love to, to do it again sometime. And, and hopefully, um, uh, potentially, I'm even talking now to have my the my book be translated into into Portuguese. So I think that might oh, that, um, be nice. Uh, um, how how's thing going? Uh, is it going to be translated? Uh, I think I th it's possible. I, I'm talking. We're in in contract talks. I guess you can say to to have that done. So we'll we'll see if if we get that done. But I know there's been um, there's been a few requests for that. So hopefully hopefully we can make that happen. Uh, I bought a uh, Scott Janish book uh, on Kindle, unfortunately. But uh, before that, all my books were uh, paper written. <laughs> I got to get you a paperback one then. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's go have dinner. You have working for dinner. Do you work at night? You, you are uh, a night I, guy, right? I, yeah, I do. It. Mike, uh, Mike comes in uh, early. Um, much earlier than anyone should be awake, in my opinion. And I, I come in a little later in the afternoon or around the, you know, 11 or so. And, and, and we work together for a, a few hours and then I take over. And a lot of times in the brewery, there's only, you know, one person can only do so much um, if you're like transferring beer or something. So it's nice to um, overlap as much as possible. But um, definitely, yeah, more of a night guy. Good night for all you guys. <laughs> Muito obrigado por terem assistido a live. É, espero que a gente tenha uma compreensão dela até melhor amanhã com as legendas. Eu sei que muita gente teve dificuldade para acompanhar. Às vezes eu aqui também, olhando muitas janelas, tive essas mesmas dificuldades. Mas eu acho que clareou bastante, assim, mudou um pouco a visão de como é, usa a madeira, porque é num, num espectro totalmente diferente do que eu esperava. A madeira ela é um meio para fazer outras coisas. Então, eu acho que a gente vai ter muitas contribuições ao longo dessa semana, das próximas três semanas, é... e isso vai ser muito engrandecedor, aos poucos. Então, é... we have a last question for you before uh, uh, we stop the, the stream from Fe again. Do you like samba? We went to we, we went to samba, right? Do you remember? Samba? Samba? No, yeah, so... it was for her. You'll have to uh, remind me. Samba, like dancing? Oh, samba. <laughs> yeah, I do. I'm, I don't know what I was doing, but I had a lot of fun doing it. I felt like a gringo there. <laughs> you, you, you was better than me. <laughs> samba, yeah. Gente, oh, boa noite Luke. e até a próxima live amanhã, neste mesmo horário, 19 horas, com o Vitor Marinho. Valeu, pessoal. Muito obrigado e até amanhã. E obrigado pela doação do Foreign Field. Até amanhã.